I never had the opportunity to share this conversation that I had with Chesley for my podcast. I didn't have the opportunity to share it until now. I really think it's a conversation that you guys want to hear. She's such a light and somebody sent me a message and said sometimes the brightest lights are fighting battles we know nothing about. So I wanted you guys to hear this conversation. Let me start because I wasn't recording because I'm really bad at um, recording things. <laughs> okay, welcome to the Universally Judged podcast, Chesley, Miss USA 2019, lawyer, respondent, you do it all. I was just in the midst of telling you that I met your mom when I realized I wasn't recording. So I met your mom in That's Atlanta. So it was so sweet. But we were leaving the prelims and this lovely lady came up behind me and she's like, Sierra, like I've, I've watched some of your videos and I'm Chesley's mom. I was like, no way. So she was so sweet. Such a sweet woman. She was, so I remember when I was competing, or when I was about to compete at USA, you made a video talking about like women you thought would make it to the top 10. And I hadn't, I hadn't been watching any predictions because I wasn't in most of them, but I was in yours and my mom recorded the whole thing, <laughs> sent it to me and was like, this lady, she's smart. She thinks that you're going to be in there. Like, see, once you oh. watch it, I was like, oh yeah, I'm so glad to see this. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's so sweet. It's funny because I actually remember I made that video and I thought, you know, you were so amazing inside and out and you know, so many talents and everything. And I was like, absolutely, she has a chance to win. Did you feel like when you were going to Miss USA that you were a dark horse? Like, did you know in yourself that you had what it took to win? I did, I did. Because I mean, I was working so hard. And I remember, I remember when I got to USA just being like frustrated because I thought, you know, I've worked so hard. I've, you know, I've, I've done all these appearances, all these speaking engagements, and there's still a chance that I won't win. Um, but I was confident that like I prepared and that if I did win, um, I would have a great reign. But, you know, just you never know. I mean, there's 51 women. I, I think somebody talked about like the amount of time you actually get in front of the judges. And it's like, what, like six minutes? No, no, no. Because yes. we have our interviews. Our interviews together are probably six minutes. But then like on stage, it's probably like another six minutes. So they have 12. Maybe, minutes. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. I was going to say maybe around 10 minutes, like almost maximum. Just because even yeah. when you're on stage, it doesn't mean that every second you're up there that they're looking at you, right? Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Yeah. I know. And you think all those months of preparation, sometimes years. Let's go back to you competing at Miss North Carolina, uh, <laughs> which I can't keep all my states straight. There's so many pageants. Did you compete twice? How many times did you compete? So I competed, I competed okay. twice in the Miss America system in North Carolina. And then I competed three times in the USA system in North Carolina and won on my third try. And that was the year, I mean, that I was going to age out. It was literally my last chance. Oh and my. I was really glad that it, that it happened. No kidding. So essentially you competed five times for a the title to go to the national competition of whether it be Miss America or Miss USA. Yes. And yes. Yes. And I've gotten close. I, like on my second try at Miss North Carolina in the Miss America system, I was first runner up. So it was like, you know, holding my, holding my hands and everything and then lost. And I was like, oh no, which I think was what, probably why I wanted to compete again because I had gotten so close. But again, that was my last chance in the Miss America system, I'd aged out that year. And so I knew how it felt to be that close and to age out. And I was like, I hope this doesn't happen again. And no it didn't. kidding. It didn't. You won. You went on to win Miss USA. That is so crazy. Is that, does that ever still feel surreal? It's, it still feels surreal, honestly. Yes. Uh, because I think there are times where I've watched the competition and I remember what it felt like to be up there and to just wonder like, is this really going to happen? Did all these years of trying, or is it finally going to pay off? Uh, so yeah, I think there are still times that it definitely does feel very, very surreal. And you became officially, which this seems so funny to say, but the oldest woman to win Miss USA. Let's, I guess we'll take things back a couple steps. You then went to Miss Universe, mm -hmm. which is so cool, in Atlanta. Were you kind of hoping it was going to be an international location for the pageant, or, or did you feel proud that it was on American soil? I was proud that it was on American soil. Uh, I, I didn't really have an opinion either way because I knew if it, we, we, had, we had announced so late. I mean, we had an idea of when the competition was going to be, but the actual announcement and people being able to buy tickets and flights and hotels um, was kind of late. And so I remember thinking if it's international, not that much of the same way to be able to go because flights are going to be really expensive. They're going to have to figure out hotels. And so when they announced and said that it was going to be in the States, I was like, oh, this is great. Like my family can come. So I was awesome. just excited that it meant that 
you know, like I, I think uh, two of my four brothers got to come. My sister could come, my dad, my stepdad, my mom, my grandparents, some of my mom's friends got to come to prelims and stuff because I mean, Atlanta is like a five hour drive from my house. Like, this is great. I was excited. That is, that is very exciting. I was so happy to be able to see you on the prelim stage. I actually saw you as well before the interviews. And it's funny because I competed at Miss Universe, but I still feel like a major fan girl. Like I saw you girls waiting for interview and I was like, oh my God, like there's Miss Venezuela, there's Chesley and Miss USA, <laughs> you know, it was so funny. What was that like to be wearing the USA sash? Did you ever feel like it was surreal? Like what was that experience like for you? Yeah, it was, it was unreal to, to be there and to be USA. I think what was funny, I remember, I remember after Zozie won, she and I were talking about the competition and, you know, both of us, I think I, I made it to the top 10. And so we were, we were both on there on stage together at some point. And uh, when I got announced in the top 10, everybody started, everybody who was supporting me in the, in the stadium was like, USA, USA. And so I remember Zosie saying to me afterwards, she's like, you guys really do that? Because I guess, I guess internationally people don't know that, that like people in the USA, we really, that, that's a chant that we would do for like international contests. I'm sure like the Olympics yeah. will do that. I'm sure like, you know, international boxing contests or whatever other sports. Um, do that. And I'm like, yeah, of course they would do that at the pageant. So it, it was really cool. And I was, I was just proud that, you know, I was USA and we were competing in the USA. It was, it was a really exciting moment. So cool. And like you said, you made it into the top 10. So you made it into the top 20 first. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you got to chat with Steve Harvey a little bit. Then you gave a personal statement, of course, outstanding because you're an amazing speaker. Mm -hmm. Then you made it into the top 10. What did that feel like to hear USA being called to make it into that top 10? It was kind of a rush. I mean, uh, I, I was just really excited. Like when, when you actually compete, you know this, because you competed, uh, you, it just, everything goes by very quickly. And I remember us like getting past the commercial break and just waiting for them to call us. And I was one of the last people from the Americas, maybe. I don't think I was called as a wild card. I was one of the last people from the Americas called into the top 20. And so when they were about to call the top 10, I was like, okay. I was like calming myself down. I was like, it's okay. You may be waiting for a while. Just be patient. They'll call your, your, you know, your nation. And, and they did, they called me like I was, I, if not, I was the first person called into the top 10. And so I was like, Oh, that was quick. And, uh, you know, Rob and, and all the other producers and, and choreographers, they try to tell you where to stand and everything. And I don't think anybody plans to be called first. You always think like somebody's going to get called first and they'll know where to go. And, and then you follow them. them. Yeah. But then you're called first. And I'm like, and then from there, I, I guess I can speak from personal experience. I made it into the top nine, I guess, kind of like you, the, the equivalent, but I didn't make it into the top six at the time for you as a top five. And to be honest, in the moment, I felt I just, when they were about to call the last name, I just had this feeling it wasn't going to be me. And I was all of a sudden okay with it. I was like, that's okay. Meant to be moving on. How did you feel when you didn't make it? Because I think this is what we don't usually talk about, is that feeling, the, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like almost the failure moment. How did you feel exactly. in that moment where you where you didn't move on? Oh my God, that's exactly how you feel. Because, you know, people are rooting for you. And, you know, during my reign, there were, there were, I had some, there were so many trolls that would come on my page and say that somebody else deserved to win um, the USA title. And so you really want to represent well. You want to do well at, at this universe because either, you know, A, to prove all those, you know, trolls wrong and say like, look, I did deserve to be here. Look how well I did. But also because like, there are people rooting for you. And, you know, we were in the US, there, my family's in the audience. I have people cheering for me. There are so many people that want me to do well and I don't want to disappoint them. And so in that moment, it is, it is really tough to sit there and can continue to smile and look really pleasant and then be escorted off the stage. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> continues in the competition. I think the most awkward part of, of not advancing forward is walking backstage past all the people who are standing backstage. And you don't know whether to make eye contact with people. And I think they don't know whether they're supposed to comfort you. And so, so, I'm, so I'm like walking around like this, like, what do I do? Where do I go? And you know, you've rehearsed everything on stage about what to do when you advance forward. They don't really tell you like, go back oh. to the room and wait now like so you don't really know what to do i, I think if, if, if and then the girls who also who didn't make it at all who didn't advance at all that i found that an interesting one because it's like you don't want to be disappointed that you didn't move forward but you moved forward beyond some of these other women who that was their dream as well so you don't want to be disappointed but you 
speaking from experience, there was a girl who made it into the final six who was like sobbing backstage. And a lot of people, they were trying to comfort her, but I think they were also like, oh, you know what? Like we would have loved to make it to the final six. You know what I mean? Whereas, so it's like that. Oh, I always, I always tell people that I would rather not make it to the top five than like be first runner up or okay. oh, I see. closer to, I would rather not. Like, so I, so I was like, you know, I wanted to advance further. But I got to tell you, it is. Have you ever been first runner-up in a pageant? Well, yes, twice. Twice. Oh, and it's because you're the first loser. You're the first loser. That's what I always say. It's tough it is. And, like, like, literally, you're so close to it. It is heart-wrenching. Yes. First runner-up. And so yes. I was like, no, God, I would rather not make yeah. the top five than be close and to be that close and still not make it. So I'm like, whatever. I would. <laughs> I'm not and honestly, backstage, it's really, it's really collegial. There's so many girls that came over to me like, oh, I did such a good job, especially girls who didn't make it. And I was like, yeah. that's so nice. That is so nice. And I think that is, I guess, a misconception is that people think that in the pageant world, all the competitors are catty, we're like out for each other, which it can happen. But for the most part, like overwhelmingly, women support each other. They're kind to each other. They're doing up each other's dresses. That at least has been my experience overall is people supporting each other no matter what. I would completely agree, and, uh, and it is unfortunate that that's what people think. I mean, I get asked that in interviews all the time. I'm sure you did too when yes. you were um, a national winner. Is like, mm -hmm. you know, what is it like? How are you know? Why are the girls so catty? I'm like, have you watched Miss Congeniality when <laughs> all of the girls were coming together to help Sandra Bullock with her makeup? That's literally what it's like. Yeah. I have actually seen that moment unfold in real life. Like I, when I was competing at North Carolina. There was a girl who didn't know how to do her makeup and they had makeup people there, but they're there to help you with touch-ups, not to do you your makeup from start to finish. And so literally there were girls walking around like, hey, can you help this girl with her makeup? Do you have any lipstick she can borrow? Do you have any eyeshadow? We're going to try to help her out. Like that moment has actually happened. So I don't especially what people think that we're just these mean, catty people when for the most part, everybody's really nice. Normal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Normal girls. And that's kind of one of the goals of this podcast is to showcase that all these amazing pageant title holders are women who are normal girls because I think as soon as someone hears that you're in pageants or you like pageants or you've competed or any of those things they immediately put you into this box you are a lawyer you have probably had so many times that people think you're a lawyer and you're a pageant girl what those things cannot coexist how, how have you felt with that how do you handle that like what has that been like for you to be both of those things that people think can't be intertwined yeah it was it was I mean frustrating and uh and you know I, I just always I always try to be grateful I think people were um trying to give me a compliment and saying like wow you're an attorney and you do this how do those two things coincide and I would try not to let it be insulting but it kind of is a little it bit. is insulting yeah yeah because it's like it's almost like people think like you have to be stupid or not have real career ambitions to compete in pageants and that's why they're so surprised but I think uh, most of those people who you know carry that level of surprise really just haven't paid attention or haven't watched pageants recently um, because like my year I talk all the time about the women who competed at USA with me like you know we had uh, a woman Miss Massachusetts who graduated from Harvard undergrad and Harvard Business School with an MBA we had Miss California who worked for Google there were so many D1 athletes people who worked for large corporations like i think miss oregon was worked for the corporate offices for, for nike so there were so many very talented accomplished women and then at universe it happened all over again there was a pilot my roommate miss ireland was a nasa data not like and so i would try to tell people like it's not just me <laughs> there are tons of smart accomplished multi-dimensional women and if you just watch just watch the competition you'll see them highlighted because all these women like you know they would have little um, video packages about us. If you, if these women advance to the top ten, we get to talk about what we've done in our, in our, in our own communities. And so I'm like, guys, just watch the competition. You will see. <laughs> anyway, speaking of Catriona and speaking of Zozi, a lot of people don't know that when you win Miss USA, when you win Miss Universe, you live in an apartment with each other. Miss USA, Miss Universe live together in an apartment in New York City. What was that like, one, to move to New York, live in the Miss Universe organization apartment, and live with two different Miss Universes? That's so cool. I know. It was so fun. I really liked it. You know, it's funny, like, me and Kat would talk about how, like, she's younger than me, but she almost felt like the mama bear at the house. Because, you know, when you're the new girl moving in, you have no idea 
where things are. And that apartment is pretty big. I mean, it's like three bedroom, three bathroom, huge square footage. There's an office in there. And so, you know, there'd be clothes places. And I'm like, whose clothes are these? There's, there are like always coats hanging in the coat closet, but they would never be mine or cats. Um, or if I needed like, you know, like there's a computer in our office, but nobody uses it. So I had so many questions for her, like, where do I what? find things? Um, they would order, the office would order groceries for us. Um, whenever we would want them. I think it was like every week or every other week or so. And so, you know, I had to talk to Kat about like, what do you order? How much do you usually order? Um, so things like that it was just like, you know, you're like a little lost child trying to figure your way around. And so, you know, for, for Kat, that's kind of how she felt. And then, you know, when Zosie moved in, like I got to take on that role for her and like tell her like, this is where things are. This is, um, you know, where you can find clothes. And poor thing, when she came to the States, it was summertime in South Africa because she wanted December. And so that's, that's summertime for them. And so she didn't have a big coat when she came, when she came to the States and won and moved in. And so I was like trying to help her find like a place where she could get a coat and we went coat shopping. So that's it was awesome. Fun. And I loved living in New York. I mean, it's an incredible city and, you know, obviously I live here now. And so it, it really stuck with me. Um, how how much I loved the city and loved the the environment and the feeling here. That's so cool. That sounds like so much fun to live with another girl and and have those experiences. Not only being women living together, but these international women who come from different places around the world. That's so cool. And you said Catriona in the Philippines. Pageants are huge there. South Africa for Zosie. I feel like pageants there are really picking up because they've had so much success with their winners. Did they find that when you know they came to New York, was it what they were expecting was it what you were expecting it's it's a very interesting thing to just be thrown into this big role right like Miss USA I know you feel like pageants aren't huge in the USA but it's a big role for you to take on you uproot your life like for all of you did you find that maybe you were ready for it was it overwhelming like what was it like for you girls yeah, yeah. I think so. I hadn't talked to to Kat and and uh, Zosie much about what they thought of New York specifically. I often ask them about what their general impression of the state was because I'm always interested in hearing what other people think of Americans because I think you know sometimes I hear from people that they think Americans are really ambitious and. Um, that they, you know, love being entrepreneurs a lot or that, you know, that we're really innovative here. And then I hear from other people that I think like Americans are kind of lazy or small minded or have tunnel vision. And so I, I always wanted to know, like, what do you really, what do you really think of us? Because if you have a bad impression, I want to help. I want to help that. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, but me, you know, I, I had visited New York before. I'd never actually lived here before. And I loved it. It's, for me, you know, I, I grew up in Charlotte primarily and had been practicing law in Charlotte for like a year and a half before I won and moved. And I just noticed that the pace here in New York is very different. Like there's always people rushing everywhere. People always feel like they have something to do, like they talk fast, like figure out, get to the point. And I loved that. I thought it was awesome because I think that's how I like to live my life. I'm, when I talk to people on the phone, I'm like, I hate when people are just, you know, have this windy way about them. Like I have 50 minutes to talk, like, no, get straight to the point. And that I appreciated about it. I think what most people are surprised about when they visit New York or live in New York is how much trash there is and mm. how it smells sometimes. Oh, stinky New York City. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of is, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the subway especially, if you pass any of the grates that connect to the subway, like sometimes you hear the subway, and it will like you'll get this big whoosh of this smell um and you know trash day there's just trash piled up everywhere and there's you know there's not very much grass especially here at midtown so people's pets will use the bathroom right on the sidewalk so there's pet pee and and just it's everywhere so i think that part of it is less fun but you still mm -hmm. get the shiny new fun touristy parts like there's always good restaurants oh, yeah. then York became like a haven for me and zozy when the pandemic started so it, it has its nasty parts, but it, overall, like, I love the city. I love New York, too. I think it's great. I've been there a few times, and it's it's amazing. But I love it. I mean, the team at Extra is incredible. I mean, I love the producers that I work with. Um, the New York bureau chief here is incredible. Um, I love that, uh, you know, the producers and my bosses that I all work with, it's a really diverse group. Um, you know, there are so many uh, women, people of color, people in the LGBTQ community, and so that I appreciate because I think having a diverse workplace is essential. Mm -hmm. And I think the entertainment nowadays, I think they've worked hard to diversify people 
in front of the camera. So it's refreshing to also see diversity behind the camera, you know, in the office as well. Very cool. And how did that happen? Working for Extra? I mean, okay, you were a lawyer, you won Miss USA, now you're working for Extra. How did that happen? Was that something you always wanted to do and the opportunity came up because of Miss USA? No, that's a funny thing. Like, I, I, I can't say I ever actually dreamed of being a correspondent. I think there were times where I would see hosts um, or even actors and think, like, how cool would that be to do that job? But now that I'm doing it, I love it. Uh, I think, you know, being an attorney, you learn how to ask questions and um, you learn how to be able to, you know, just get information from people or make them feel comfortable or at ease, especially when you're doing depositions, which I did um, a, a very, a, a huge number amount of depositions when I was an attorney. Uh, and so I think those skills are like transfer over very well. But beyond that, you know, half the reason I loved being an attorney was because I'm just nosy. And <laughs> I like, I, you know, I, I used to say curious or inquisitive, but it really is just nosiness. And uh, I always loved hearing from people and hearing their stories. And that's helpful when you're doing depositions and you need to know every angle of a story and how an event happens so that you as an attorney can, you know, figure out your case. And I think that's exactly what I do as a correspondent. You know, I, people will talk about their stories or talk about events or talk about what happens to them. And I'm genuinely interested in what they have to say. And I think that is essential when you're a journalist or when you're in entertainment on the hosting or correspondent side. You have to want to know about people. And I really, really do. And that's been helpful. That comes across as more genuine when you're actually truly listening to the people, which that goes a long way in normal life as well. Truly listening to someone and what they have to say. I apologize as well. I keep calling you lawyer, but it's in the US. It's attorney. Here it's oh. lawyer. I'm sure a lot of people ask you this as well. Do you ever think you would return to being an attorney or is that something maybe far off in the future? Do you even have a desire right now? Yeah, I haven't thought I haven't thought a whole lot about it. I think right now my focus is on being a correspondent and um, you know, just improving my craft that, that I'm, you know, in right now. And, uh, you know, I got to this year, I got to do um, analyst duties during the Miss USA finals for Miss USA 2020. I got to co-host um, prelim shows for teen and for Miss, and then I got to co-host um, teen finals. And so doing all of that was so much fun. So that's really, really where my head is. Um, but I'm still connected with the firm that I worked for in North Carolina. I'm their first ever diversity advisor. And so that's so much fun. And I'm glad to remain connected to them because I truly loved my firm. I'm just really glad to, to focus on, on what I've gotten from you right now. Absolutely. Focus on what you're doing right now. I, I love that. I feel like we always get asked some of these questions and we're like, let us just be in the moment. Okay. Let us like <laughs> enjoy it. Hey, she, when, when she was in interviews, I, as soon as she won, people were like, so what's next when you're done with the tours? And she'd be like, I'm okay saying that I don't know and just the, leaving things up to, you know, what's going to happen and what's going to unfold. And I almost think like that's a better way to approach things because I think if I had started off my reign saying like, I'm going to do this, this, and this, um, definitively, I would have closed things off. I mean, I had, I wrote down a list of like 10 goals that I had. And uh, I think when I, when I reviewed them closer to the end of my reign, it was like, you're thinking too small because you've done basically all of these things. So, you know, I think, you know, turns to a certain extent, you really do have to watch things play out because sometimes they're better than you would have imagined. Most definitely. I think it's, it's obviously, you need to have goals, but then you also have to be open to the other possibilities because things so often happen that we don't expect, like don't see coming, the opportunity is there, but when you are too close-minded, that opportunity might not present itself because you might not see it because you're so focused on this other thing that you don't. So I think that's a great way to think. Speaking of all of that, being closed-minded, all of this, when you win Miss USA, there's a lot of pressure on you. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to be too open to the opinions of others. Mm -hmm. How did you handle the trolls? Like, did any of that play on your mental health of people trying to bring you down, trying to say you didn't deserve it, someone else deserved it more than you, and basically just belittling you and who you are? How did you deal with that on the mental health side of things? Um, I tried to just ignore it, which wasn't easy, um, but... I think I'd started experiencing it when I first started competing in state pageants. I remember when I won my first preliminary competition because in North Carolina, um, in the Miss America system, in order to advance to state, you have to win a local pageant, like your city pageant or county pageant or sometimes a festival one. And so I just won my first preliminary pageant the first year that I started competing. And there was this, this anonymous um, board where people could anonymously post and it was a public board. And I remember going on to it 
um, when I first went, because, you know, people tell you not to go on those things now, but when you're, a, when you're a newbie, you don't know. Mm -hmm. and I remember going on there and somebody had posted like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she won. She's so ghetto. Have you looked on her social media page? Her Facebook's <laughs> terrible. And it just like ruined my night, literally ruined my night. I remember I was on cloud nine because I finally won. My friends were there. And I just remember thinking like, this is awful. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> clearly woefully underprepared to go to state and uh, so I think you know having to deal with it over the years made it easier to deal with when I got to the national level uh, I was a part of this the, so at first you know there was this sort of anonymous called like a boy boy board um, that that I used to look on when I was um, in the Miss America system but they had one for the USA system but they moved to Facebook and it was like this private um boy board that people would talk it's like a got like a thousand people in it and i was a member of this board when i won my state pageant when i won miss north carolina usa and i just remember people like going on there and thinking like you know that it was going to be so cool like look i finally won and i remember going on there and people were just like ripping me to shreds like somebody like they called me scrawny they said i was ugly they said that you know my first runner-up was more deserving they couldn't believe that I that I won. Like I definitely wasn't in contention for the national title, and that's when I left that board. <laughs> I, Good for you. I know. I just I had to, and I sort of used that same logic for like my social media pages. People would be posting like throw up faces on my on my. Um, so I would just delete their comments and then block them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I recently rejoined that anonymous board and they're still like, they still go, because I truly am a pageant fan. But some yes, of these boards, same. They have, they have more information than is on my feed. Like they, they know who's won in other countries. They have the dresses. They'll mm -hmm. show full montages of like people like over the years competing, which is always fun and so sweet to look at. But then there's just like this visceral hatred on these boards. It's and so bad. filter it out sometimes and ask people like, what like what is so wrong with your life that you feel you yeah. have this negative mm -hmm. it's, it's really it's really concerning sometimes and so i've thought more and more you know since i've ended my reign about just leaving the board again but i just i'm such a huge pageant fan and i really just want to see like the positive side of things it, it is very honestly sometimes i feel like it's surreal of how nasty people can be and i sometimes want to message people and say like are you okay are you okay because like that's the thing like you can't be okay and no. and be that hateful towards That's what you. I mean. Yeah, and no. so that's that's the approach I tried to take was like, okay, this this them them calling me, you know, these these awful names has almost nothing to do with me. You know, no. I think many of these people have probably been called awful names themselves. Um, there was one person who recently was was talking about me and other title holders who had won in the IMG era. Mm. And like, I didn't think any of them were beautiful except for our current winner. And I was like, and you know, and this isn't shade to anybody because I, I think all of these women are beautiful and all of them have been deserving of the title. Um, but I remember commenting back and because somebody was like, that's really insulting. I commented back and I think I tagged the guy and I was like, it is insulting because you can comment, you can, you can compliment somebody without insulting other people. And so I remember visiting this person's page and there's almost no pictures of this person on, on their, their Facebook page. And so I thought, maybe you're calling other people ugly because you think that you're ugly and um you know you called those names before and so you're just copying that same hatred that mm -hmm. people have been throwing at you and so i try to just be positive and uh just try to understand like you know hurt people hurt people and For sure. people when they throw this or just showing the own you know darkness of their own internal um being and like oh you must be a really hurt person to be throwing that shade at people Oh, I 100% I agree. And I feel like so much we, we want diversity in all areas, especially in pageantry. We want to see different shapes, sizes, colors, hair types in the pageant world, in life in general, but in pageants. But as soon as it starts happening, as soon as the change starts happening, people are like, whoa change i don't like, like this right and and since i'm gear i mean i placed at miss universe i was a curvier girl for what you know people would expect and to this day people tag me and they're like the img era ruined miss universe and i'm like oh, oh my god. god how much of an insult is that like you ruined like you and your body ruined what you know pageants are about it's so sad and i do not take it personally anymore i don't even give a shit to be honest but i'm just like that is like the, the that is the most insult 
insulting thing you can say to a woman is like you and your body, your being who you are ruined something, right? And anyways, talking about body, you worked very hard on your physical physique for Miss Universe that I remember actually, I think hearing something that you were like, I'm eating this, this, and this, like it was very um, regimented, very specific. Was it, was it pretty intense? Tell us about that experience. Oh my God, it was so intense. That's <laughs> probably like the part about competing that I disliked the most. And obviously mm -hmm. nobody pressured me to do that for myself. I mean, I decided that, um, you know, I was a, I was a division one athlete when I was in undergrad. And so when I approached the competition, I just thought I need to be in the best shape possible. Like I Absolutely. need to be in a good position. And so that's the way that I approached pageants was like, you know, I only get one shot at this. You only get, you only go to Miss Universe once. And so I need to make sure that I'm in the best, um, you know, physical uh, shape that I have ever been in my entire life. And that meant having a very restricted diet. And so I like, you know, I have a huge sweet tooth and I love carbs. So I restricted basically everything. Like I was like, no dessert. I could have dessert on the weekends. Those were my cheat days, Saturdays and Sundays. And, uh, you know, during the week I wasn't, I restricted myself to no bread or only like a small serving of bread each day. Like I didn't do pasta. I just did all vegetables and wow. fruits because fruit had so much, so many carbs in it. Like it was, whew, it was a lot. I'm glad that I'm done. But no. I mean, <laughs> I got me to the place where I was very proud of my body and I was very happy, felt very comfortable. And it was still funny. Like people would post my, um, you know, my swimsuit photos and say like, she's so big. And people didn't realize like I was literally a size zero. I could fit a size double zero right. um, when I, my waist was like a 25, like that's how many inches my waist was. And so people don't realize like the camera really does add a lot of weight to you. Well, and yeah. You talk about your body on stage as if you are like this sloppy, <laughs> you know, out of shape woman. All I saw was a woman, a woman with curves, like the same that you would see in any state in the US. And so it was very mm -hmm. Hearing that from people because I'm like, there's nothing wrong with this woman. Like, mm -hmm. no thick figure, but like, I don't. Th I think that's sort of the direction that our community is moving into, rather than forcing women to starve themselves constantly and just, sub you know, subsist on cigarettes and water and coffee all day. Like, we're asking women to be healthy and mm -hmm. they want, and that's okay. That's a positive message to share. You know, like I said, I think over the years we've started expanding the standard of beauty that people have for women, you know, as it applies to, you know, our faces, but also like our bodies as well. Like, I think there are so many stars who lately have come out and had six packs and had more toned bodies or had more curvy bodies. And I think that's important for people to see you know, different women in different shapes and understand that you don't have to be one single shape in order to be beautiful. I think, you know, there's so many teens who, who look up to us and who watch Miss Universe or watch Miss USA and they think they're beautiful because their bodies are similar to what they see on TV. And that's important because we have to make sure that we show them that different bodies are beautiful. I had so many people who said to me that I gave them confidence, not necessarily because I looked exactly like them, but because they just saw a little bit of diversity on the stage to like to all these women who they admire. And I'm like, that's exactly why we're here. Like, yeah, we all want to win, of course, but we're ultimately here to show something greater to the world, right? And I think that's what also people don't understand is that it isn't just being a certain size, walking on stage, giving strong answers. There's such a greater effect to people around the world that can last truly a lifetime for some people. Yes, I completely agree. And it's so important. I mean, I remember being a kid and looking up to um, like Halle Berry and thinking like my face has to look like hers in order to be, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, looking up to, you know, a number of different actresses and hosts and musicians and thinking like, Beyonce can move this way. I have to learn how to do that so that I can be pretty or attractive or so I can have a boyfriend or thinking like this girl has a boyfriend. So it's like, the, I think people, especially older people forget how impressionable you are as a young person. Forget, like, you know, people conform to those they look up to. And so we need to really diversify the people that we look up to and not, you know, saying that any of the people who I looked up to were wrong. No. Um, you know, we look up to them and it's important to remember, like, we have to set a good example and a different example as well. This year for the, well, I guess it was technically 2019 for the first time, Miss USA, Miss Teen USA, Miss Universe and Miss America were all 
black women. How did that make you feel to be in that group? That is just incredible. Yeah, it was a great group. I mean, you know, we had, um, I think it was one of those moments that you know, like reality, especially being a part of it. I think if I was just still a woman competing and not a national title holder, I would have been excited. And for me as a pageant fan, as a woman of color, it was exciting to see like photos of us all together. And then to like, look and see like my little face in, the, in that group. <laughs> I get to be a part of this too. Somebody sent me, I actually have like a photo that somebody sent me of, it's literally sitting like right here in my movie. Oh my God. Um, like the, the five of us together. And it's, I think people have like, you know, drawn cartoons of us and made art of us. And it's just exciting to see and even more thrilling to actually be a part of that group. It's just, oh, I think it's so incredible. And I remember, I mean, I was there this year watching Miss Universe when Zozy won. And I thought this is so important, not only for the world to see, but for young women to see. And I remember seeing a bunch of videos of like little girls who had short hair like Zozy being like, she looks like me. And I'm like, that is the most important thing. Like it's exciting for Zozy. It's, she's going to have an amazing you know, career as a woman. But that is like the most important thing for us to see is that these little girls are saying she looks like me and then all of a sudden all of her dreams could become a reality. So I just, I think that's just well, I think, an amazing thing. I think it, it's not even just a, just important for, for young women. I think it's important for, you know, women of many ages, um, men as well, to see this darker skinned black woman with short coarse hair. I remember her posting um, after she won and her caption was like how important it is to see it on my short horse hair. And I remember her saying the word horse because for, for many black women, especially and women who have natural hair, horse was almost like a curse word. Like you couldn't right. say that. Really? But, okay. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Because like there, I, I think, you know, um, just, I mean, there's obviously racism across, across our planet. <laughs> Within the black community, we suffer a lot from colorism. We suffer a lot wanting their hair to be a certain way or a certain style or you know a certain texture and so people always want like the really nice curly hair or the good hair and there's literally a definition for how your hair has to look and so coarse is not on that spectrum or was not on that spectrum wow. and so seeing her say that and seeing her say like the miss universe crown <laughs> coarse hair was like a moment and it was exciting that's and it was so in the world that was exciting for me as a black woman with you know natural hair i'm sure it was exciting for tons of women across the planet and i was glad that she really seized that moment and pointed <laughs> out a problem that the black community has and was like well i'm beautiful so you can't be too i'm i'm pretty confident that oprah tweeted about her and so speaking of oprah you met oprah what tell us about that <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like definitely top three moments of my reign. I always list like like Oprah meeting her and like doing the Gamecock cheer at my undergrad university and then like meeting Tom Brady was probably cool too. Oh, um, Tom Brady. What a dreamy man. <laughs> yeah. He was. Well, we, were, we were playing flag football with Tom Brady for best buddies. And I remember right. play in the, in the game or whatever. And like, <laughs> Brady looked at me and he points. He's like, good defense. Uh, best moment of Chesley's life, Tom Brady saying she has good defense. <laughs> Quarterback. Um, so no, so so you know those are definitely my top three. I would say Oprah was like number one, um, but she's incredible, incredible. I don't know how this woman has energy to do all the interviews that she does. I mean, I thought you know my media weeks were were intense, but I mean she. I was like the last reporter, one of the last reporters out of a row of reporters and she'd done an interview that morning and I think she ran during the interview. I mean, it was just utter craziness, but just the kindness and patience that she had when I was talking to her, it was like, you're, you're a professional. You do this for a living, don't you? <laughs> it's like, um, it was, it was incredible to meet her. And I asked her for a picture afterwards and she took this picture. She has her arm like wrapped around my waist, like her best friends. And I was just like, I love you, Oprah. Like, I think people oh say, like don't meet your idols because sometimes they will disappoint you. And for mm. Oprah, it has been more magical to meet this woman. Um, and uh, I think she surpassed any expectation that I had for her because she is perfection. And I mean, I think that's why so many people admire her maybe is because the people who have had the opportunity to meet her then share with other people, she is just as amazing. 
as she seems to be. So, oh, that is, that's so cool. Tom Brady and Oprah, hey? <laughs> that was like one of the best moments. In, in undergrad, to tell you a little bit about the Gamecock cheer, Sierra, it's, it's the bomb. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, tell me about it, please. I, I have no understanding of this. <laughs> Gamecock, people think that I'm saying a curse word when I'm saying that. It's literally just like a fighting chicken. Um, okay. Like, like our mascot for the University of South Carolina, where I went to undergrad or university. And uh, we would have, you know, these huge football games. Our football stadium seats like well over 70,000 people. And at the beginning of each football game, they had a celebrity starter who stands in the middle of the field with all these people around them. And they start this cheer where half the stadium says game, half the stadium says Cox, and it just goes back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm standing in the stadium with like 70,000 people and they hand me this mic and I'm like, um, I can't remember what I said. I think, oh, I said I may travel all across the USA, but I'll always bleed garnet and black, which are our colors. Then everybody's screaming, I'm like, yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm very happy that you elaborated on that because I was a little curious and it's pretty cool to envision you in the middle of 70,000 people with a mic just like rock on. That is so cool. I love that. Okay, well, I think that was an amazing note to end all of these adventures you've shared with us. One last question I have for you is, is there any piece of advice you wish you would have known when you were younger, before Miss USA, maybe even before you started pageants. I know your mom was in pageantry. Is there anything that you wish you would have known before all of this has happened? Um, I, I wish I would have had more bravery and courage just to be myself. Because there were so many times where I felt like I was emulating other people because I thought that that was the way I needed to be, whether it was the way that I said my name on stage or the way that I walked or my wardrobe or things that I said, there were so many times where I thought she said this and people like her, so I can say that rather than saying what I really felt or doing what I really felt or wearing what I felt was most authentic to me. And I think there are even times today where I still have to remind myself, just be you, just be unique and be yourself and authentic. And you know, I think that has ended up being a huge cliche, especially in the pageant world, being authentic and being unique. But truly, I mean, it's, it's become a cliche because people have to pound that message into our brains until we get it day after day. So uh, that's, you know, the, I think that's the one change I wish I would have made, like not having to worry as much about impressing people and just trying to be myself and being able to stand on my own two feet, which, um, like I said, is still something that I, that I have to do today. Beautiful. It's something we need to remind ourselves all the time. So it just sounds every single day, right? It is cliche, but like you said, because it maybe has to be, is not only in pageants, not only in, you know, big career moves, just in daily life, just be, be yourself, like love yourself, wear what you want to wear, do what you want to do. It's easier said than done. Yeah. Well, I think, I think those are the people who have become iconic and memorable and trailblazers in our society. I mean, people remember Beyonce because who, who else can you think of who is like Beyonce? I mean, she, you know, took risks in her career. She is one of the most incredible performers that many of us have ever seen. I just finished watching the um, documentary about Princess Diana on Netflix. And, you know, I think people loved her and remembered her because she went outside of the standards that she was supposed to abide by as a princess. Mm -hmm. People loved her for it. People just thought that she was this caring, authentic woman who was stylish and fashionable, but empathetic as well. And I think people remember her because she was different. So if people just if you do that, just be yourself. Do you be what feels good to you, even if it's different? What a great message to end. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your stories, for being so open and honest. And I appreciate it so much. Hopefully we'll run into each other one day in the future, maybe at a future Miss Universe or something. You and I can be like the pageant fans in the audience, like with flags. I'll also hold a USA flag and a Canada flag, you know, just to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll chant it. I'll even chant it. I'll, I'll get in there with you. Love that. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully we'll chat one day soon. Yes. <laughs> Bye.